Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. This is our uh, fourth webinar. Uh, our webinar is Oracles of iInnovation. We are happy to discuss with you all about innovations. Our uh, mission is uh, to motivate young generation, also to motivate women. We would like to see more women in this webinar. And uh, we would like to discuss latest technology, what can we do? Uh, this is fun. Also, this is uh, interactive discussion. Thank you so much to join us. Uh, today, we have a wonderful, very uh, famous speakers. Uh, I will not take your time longer. We have a very uh, busy, intense program. Uh, our first speaker is Beatrice Kohner from France. Thank you so much, Beatrice, to uh, accept our invitation. Uh, he will, she will talk about supervision. She is from France, uh, Chair Department of Ophthalmology uh, from Brest. Thank you so much. We are listening to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Aileen, actually, for your kind invitation and for offering me uh, the opportunity to uh, do the introduction on this on this nice topic. We today, if we provide a definition for supervision, it will be not focused on 2020 and refraction zero, but it's first of all based on quality of vision. That means good vision, whatever the surrounding lighting conditions. And so uh, the perfection for the patient, it's uh, also quite easy to guess. Uh, it's something that will be a continuous focus with no functional symptoms and a good contrast. He will forget about his eyes and will get just what he, what he expects. In other words, it's important not to make it to expect too much and to explain to him that so, so far and nowadays, we don't have any magic surgeries. The perfection for the surgeon, uh, it's today focused on this it's a very special, special area, which is called the social vision, which is more, no more than an highlight need on intermediate vision. Patients will see from far to near with no differences between the, the different, uh, I would say, main focus. So in other words, uh, for the surgeon, it's to get something that is predictable to what you are expecting for. And we all know that an happy patient is an, makes the surgeon happy. That's why selection, information, and calculation is something very important. Uh, there is a new requirement with the advent of premium IOL. That's why these presentations uh, got the, the role of an introduction, because you will make a difference between the different IOL that will be presented to you uh, after this talk, and you will make the, dif the big differences, especially on the criteria of quality of vision. We are all talking today on aspheracity, uh, with the goal of improvement for mesopic vision. For multifocal lenses, we know the light loss, uh, especially impacting the vision quality and contrast sensitivity. And we, we have this new category of EDAF with the target of continuous social vision. But it's all about compromise. We are looking for good visual acuity with spectacular independency and with a good correction and preservation of quality of vision. And the evaluation of post-biopia surgery today cannot escape from the different parameter that you need to collect. Of course, you, you have the visual acuity, the different distances. Uh, you have the mono and binocular vision to check. And you will uh, add to that a specific, again, focus on intermediate vision in addition to the, the near vision. But uh, on top of that, you need to measure the quality of vision. Uh, in checking the subjective vision and some objective measurement of that. It's uh, all these different aspects that we will discuss today. The subjective evaluation can be based on questionnaire of life. They will collect the functional symptoms. We have many of them published and not all of them are easy to use. The patients need to uh, not to feel, uh, I would say 10 pages of functional symptoms. They, they need to be quite uh, efficient. And they will, uh, at the end of the day, try to provide you a grading of that. You know the main symptoms that you are looking for. Halos, dysphotopsia, glare, diplopia, fluctuations, burning, itching, dry eye, ocular fatigue. Uh, you need to grade that in checking the frequency. And there is an obvious difference in symptoms that will appear always, often, sometimes, or never. In severity, if they do impair all activities in life, 
in the in only the night vision or mesopic vision, and if the patient can live with, with them. Uh, you need to make a difference, of course, if, if there is a, a functional symptom that is spontaneously reported, then uh, if it's only appearing when you are looking for. Uh, as a summary, but I mean, that will be debated in, with the, the, the later uh, presentations, we can uh, assume that more uh, for the multifocal, more than 40% of them will report halos, but actually only less than 10% will report it to be severe during the night vision. The bifocal uh, actually uh, today don't provide less uh, halos than trifocal. That's the beauty of the, the, the big advance in optics. And the EDF also induce halos. And we need to keep in mind that especially if you target minimum of vision, you will increase halos. For the subjective satisfaction, we, we are all looking for spectacular independency. And of course, you also need to target if that will be uh, considered for distance, for near, for intermediate vision, if the patients will go back to spectacles for always, often, sometimes, never. If the patients would reduce the surgery and we recommend it to friends or, or, good, or, or relatives. And all of these will depend on the preoperative information on the patient's expectation and how the question is asked. Some, uh, of course, unsatisfaction can be reported. And actually, even if we are all talking about unsatisfied patient, it's not so common to have to exchange these lenses. You need to, to provide a good balance between risk and benefit, and the patient needs to understand the, the, what means compromise. Neuroadaptations. I mean, we, we cannot today uh, provide a good assessment of it, uh, unless if you go for functional RMI, but we know that it does exist and that's why we, we need to invite patients to patients. Uh, that will take time up to six months sometimes. And we know also the binocular synergy that does exist between the two eyes, especially required for multifocal and need of lenses. The light de dependency is also something that you need to keep in mind, especially for multifocal IOS. Then after we can consider the objective evaluations. Video topography is very interesting to consider because you, you will uh, express looking at the images, the corner regularities, the asperity uh, with the assessment of the Q factor coming from the elevation map and the corner aberrometry. We know the link uh, between aspericity as a, an up, uh, I mean, as a geometric uh, entity and the spherical aberration, which is of course an IRD aberration expressing the visual quality on an, a very objective way. Regarding the aberrometry, it's not so easy actually to get reliable measurement, especially in the field of multifocal IOLs. We can recommend the eye tracing measurement as a preference, and we will assess this eye order aberration especially focusing on spherical aberration, prefoil and coma. Uh, this measurement, I mean, this platform can also provide you the MTF, which is more or less corrected to contrast sensitivity. And it's something that it's very interesting as a quantification of quality of vision. What about the scatter light? You know, the, uh, the way we are assessing the quality of diffusion of the, of the light through the different media of the eye, Objectively, you can do that using the sequence platform. Uh, and you can also get a, a nice approach using the OCAS, uh, the, the, also the DLI, uh, which is also something that, again, approach the quality of the transmission of the light through the eye. We know the indices, the OSI, that actually can be impacted with a cataract, with an, a, a dry eye, but also with any IOS problems. The pupillometry, should be actually interesting if you consider it on a dynamic um, approach, which is uh, not so commonly the way you are uh, doing this measurement, but uh, whatever the measurement you are, you, are, you are using, we know that multifocal lenses with especially diffractive models will be pupil dependent when some of the EDF, especially the one based on aspheracity modulation, will uh, certainly be less dependent of it. So it's certainly something that you will discuss later on. The chromatic aberration, 
Many of these new lenses are telling you that they, are, they, they do have the ability in correcting this chromatic aberration. Actually, we, we have no way to assess them on, on, in the clinical practice. Uh, they pretend to be corrected by some of them uh, when we know that the colors that are out of focus can cause blur and reduction in contrast sensitivity and contrast vision. That's why it's so important to target this correction. Then after we, are, we need to check the contrast sensitivity on a conventional way that's gonna be based, especially on this vector vision, uh, checking the meso and mesopic condition. But I mean, this new platform available today can also get, give a very nice approach of it. I mentioned before the MTF, uh, but there are some new platforms offering you this multitask for objective assessment of quality of vision. I have no financial interest in any of them, but I will focus especially on the Alston University platform that will give you a different distance, this sort of uh, curve that you, you can get also in a conventional way under the different scale of grays. And it's how it looks. And you, you can, of course, you can assess all of these lenses that you will discuss uh, tonight. Then, of course, the defocus curve, which is based on the fogging test, going from minus four to plus two. Again, this is the same kind of platform can provide you that on a very automatic and very friendly way. Uh, we know the bifocal lenses providing you the two peaks, the trifocal, a plate, the EDF, a dome shape. As this advanced monofocal will also target the same kind of continuity in the defocus curve, looking for the same dome with maybe less performance at near compared to the other, but it's all about the discussion that we're gonna have tonight. What about the reading speed? I mean, this one can be uh, provided by different uh, platform. We can, for instance, mention the Salzburg reading chart, as the Alston that I mentioned before can also provide this, this kind, the same kind of measurement. Uh, the beauty of it, it's using some adjustable parameters uh, regarding the tax size, the contrast, the luminance, the reading, uh, the reading distance. And then after you will get this uh, capacity of providing this curve, checking this uh, capacity for the patients to read on a very easy way. There are some recommended parameters that we can here highlight in this uh, uh, salmon uh, area, as you can see, 40 centimeters with some specific character size. It's very important, of course, to standardize all these parameters to be able to do any comparison between different lenses. You will get that the same way with this Aston University platform. Then after the halometry, and uh, I know for instance that GERD, we certainly debate on it, this platform can also do the same, measuring the degree of obscuration of a target from a glass source. And all the new platforms that can assess these parameters will do uh, more or less the same. Uh, what you are looking at actually uh, in you this increment of 0.5 degrees moving in a direction, you will guess this kind of a graph that will show you, I mean, uh, of course, the more it's extended, the more you can spread this area and the, the, the more halos uh, will be induced. You can see here, for instance, the control group uh, to the, the results that we achieved using a new heat of lens for post-operative uh, coronary refractive surgery for post uh, lasik patients operated for cataract. So anyway, it's all about quantifications of quality of vision and then, uh, the final key point, uh, there is a need to focus on ocular surface. We know the impact on preoperative measurement, on keratometry, topography, aberrometry. Uh, I mean, as soon as we are talking about instability in the tear film, you, you will get this liability of images, wrong Im measurement, and finally inadequate surgical decision. Because there is an optical power of the tear film that will condition the refractive power of the cornea and the stability of the visual performances. And normally between two blinks, there is no so much differences in the tear film thickness and no impact on the refraction. But it's not the case. As soon as we do have a significant instability, you can even lead to big changing up to one diopters. And the risk factors will accumulate, accumulate of course, with the age. So the uh, OSD on top of it uh, is quite often insidious. 
it's easy to, I mean, to, to think about it as soon as patients report functional symptoms. It's much more complicated when it's purely based on quality of vision. This contrast sensitivity is so difficult to explain after the surgery as to be not related to the lens, but to the ocular surface. That can even lead to anxiety and depression. That's why it's so important to detect preoperatively, and it may be too late to do it after the surgery. So I would say in conclusion that in 2020, the quality of vision in lens surgery, especially is something that is really based and, uh, in the definition on, on this supervision. And it's, be, it's becoming just a priority to focus on it. It's far beyond the pure visual acuity. So it's not only a question of achieving 2020. It's becoming even more crucial than in corneal surgery in the field of the presbyopia correction. And we have a, a wide range of exploration developed to quantify this quality of vision that I showed you. Um, and uh, we have actually, uh, thanks to them, we, we were able to uh, better understand this optical aberration. It's becoming just required today, especially to evaluate the outcome of refractive IOLs, to demonstrate the additional value of these new optics and to compare the one concept to the other. So I hope that my colleagues, my good friends, will uh, use this kind of parameters to make a comparison and to defend the different concepts. And uh, I'm ready to vote for the winner. Thank you for your kind attention. Uh, thank you so much, Beatrice, for a nice presentation. Uh, I, I have a quick question for you. Uh, in your practice, uh, which measurements you are using routinely? Uh, I must say that, you know, nowadays, routinely, definitely, the video topography and instability, the OCAS, the contrast sensitivity MTF, and a question of life uh, is, is just becoming, I mean, uh, it, it does belong to our routine practice. And so when we do the measurement and we do the comparison, I do all the rest of the measurements. So that's why, to me now, a, a dealing with press biopic correction means that you need to extend uh, I mean, your arsenal of exploration, if you want to do that in a proper way and to, to understand the patient's complaint, especially. Okay, thank you so much. Is there any question from other speakers? I, ha I have a question for you, Beatrice. So I think you, you outlined in, in, in a fantastic way the, the tools we have to understand potential complaints and especially after implantation. My question goes along, what are the checkpoints or the, the, the tools we should use to avoid the complaints in the first place? So what are the steps that is required to make sure for the lens I'm implanting, for the patient expectation, for his personal life situation, that you know, we're not generating a patient that will be unhappy down the road or not fully satisfied with his results? So aside from, I think you covered nicely the research elements and what we really have to do to understand the optics of these lenses and their impact, but what are the steps we need to do to you know, match the lifestyle with, with the potential solution? I think that, you know, um, it's definitely necessary to discuss with the patients to understand the way, I mean, what kind of activities, what kind of expectation he does have and talking about what he can expect uh, in not making uh, him too much expect, I would say, I mean, as I, as I mentioned before. So I think that it's, first of all, considering his age, considering his, his um, uh, lifestyle uh, will um, make you make the proper choice in terms of, um, I, I would say, of, of lenses. I mean, I mean, I know that it's the step of introduction, but I can even uh, to tell you that at that stage for me, a uh, young people, a young person who is looking for spectacular independency, not too much demanding, will go for a trifocal. And uh, the EDF, uh, in my hands, are uh, more for, uh, I would say, older patient, aging patient, and patient with specific demand. In that case, uh, we will first of all focus on providing good quality of vision and maybe as a compromise, not as good for mm -hmm. your vision performance. But I mean, compromise will be certainly one of the, of the key conclusion of, of, of this uh, big debate that we, you will open tonight. And I think that talking with the patients, 
uh, making him, him not too much expect is one of the key uh, value. And I, prom I promise you that so far, I, I didn't have to, to exchange any lenses just because of that, I guess. So tomorrow, because we are talking about the COVID uh, era, I think that one of the key advantage of this terrible, uh, crazy crisis will be to develop this online questionnaire that will help us certainly uh, to uh, decrease the time that needs to be spent with the patients. You know, something that will help us to maybe uh, understand on, on, on a good way in which area, in which box, I would say, we can put these patients regarding uh, his demand and uh, his specific uh, needs in life. Thank you, Beatrice. Thank you very much. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you, Beatrice. Our next speaker uh, is uh, Pavel Stutka. Uh, he is medical director of Gemini Eye Clinic from Czech Republic. Uh, he will talk about Look Smart Intraocular Lenses. Thank you so much, Pavel, accepting us. Thank you for a wonderful talk. So, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Pavel Stadulka, Czech Republic, uh, and uh, I would uh, like to thank, uh, and I, first of all, I intentionally do not say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, because I believe we have people from all over the world here, and thank you, uh, Chris, Eileen, and Michal for creating this uh, great online forum where I'm going to share the world first clinical result of a new ED of IOL called LookSmart. So uh, the LookSmart uh, IOL fits within the ED of category and the extended depth of focus lenses extend the depth from uh, distance to intermediate, which is quite important in, in today's uh, lives. So it increases glass independence by improving uh, the intermediate vision with minimal impact on distance vision quality. That's the main uh, target of this lens category. And it uh, technically creates visual zone instead of focal points and reduces halo and glare com compared to trifocal IOLs. So uh, having said that, it's still always a compromise between the optical quality and extended range of vision. So uh, in uh, one direction, we increase the depth of field. In the other direction, the same time, we decrease the contrast sensitivity. So like very many things in our lives, we need to find the proper balance. Uh, monofocal lenses uh, tend to have one focus. Uh, still, you know that you have some aberrations, especially spherical aberration. Uh, associated mon monofocal IOS, but uh, with EDOF IOS, uh, intentionally we increase depth of focus by creating this uh, extended uh, uh, range of foci. And we fortunately have uh, recently a definition uh, what uh, EDOF IOL means by American National Standard Institute. And it uh, says that depth of focus at least 0.5 diopter greater than monofocal IOL. Distance corrected intermediate visual acuity at 66 centimeters superior to monofocal. Distance corrected intermediate visual acuity uh, 0.2 logmar equal or better, which equals to 0.63 decimal in at least 50% of eyes. And corrected distance visual acuity non-inferior to monofocal which means 0.1 logmar uh, at least. There are currently no criteria regarding visual disturbances for EDOF IOLs, which are uh, certainly a downside of this uh, concept. There are several main categories of EDOF technologies, diffraction, refraction, and pinhole. Just to briefly introduce them, and you will hear more from other speakers. Uh, one of the typical examples from diffractive EDOF IOL is Techni Symphony IOL, and uh, from the refractive EDOF technology is Isopure for Physiol, and the pinhole EDOF technology is IC8 from Acufocus. Extended depth of focus lenses, by definition, extend the depth focus curve. So uh, it's usually uh, 1.5 to 2 diopters, and you see a typical curve here at this picture for different distances. And you can also uh, demonstrate uh, this by MTF curves. 
and you see the red uh, arrow, uh, the horizontal arrow for the EDOF lenses covering both distance and intermediate uh, distances. And then there is quite poor uh, near vision uh, uncorrected typically for this lens category. Uh, so having said that, we have distance and intermediate uh, uncorrected uh, vision, but we have uh, some uh, side effects, but it's definitely less side effects with most of the EDOF IOLs compared to trifocals, which are very well known. Uh, and I personally very much like trifocal IOLs and I implant a lot of them, but still there are some patients which would opt for EDOF IOL. Uh, even if it's a simple concept optically, it still requires cortex plasticity and some time for patients to adapt for this uh, new uh, EDOF IOL. And the typical patient uh, which would opt for EDOF IOL seeks social range of vision, uh, so which allows them to do uh, intermediate and distance daily activities, which are typically, you know, driving, looking at the navigations and there are ever uh, more complex navigations. This is a Tesla car in the middle, which I currently drive. And there is really a lot of inter information in the intermediate, which you need. And, uh, you know, you, you, all of us use computers, tablets, uh, smartphones, and so on. So now I'm going to introduce uh, the new IOL uh, called LookSmart from Bausch & Blom, which I happen to implant uh, the for the first in the world. And this IOL has a very sophisticated central bump, which extends the depth of focus. Here you see the yellow bump. It's uh, two millimeter in diameter and increases the depth of focus uh, by combination of six and uh, fourth order spheric aberrations of opposite signs. There is a transition zone uh, around it and the periphery is monofocal, uh, a spheric surface aberration free. And here we see the aberrations of that center bump. As I <laughs> said earlier, fourth and sixth uh, higher order aberrations of opposite side. Uh, why is that? It's based on the vision research, and there is one of the papers uh, which uh, was just uh, taken as a base for this concept. And it's basically said, uh, it's uh, here on the third uh, column, that uh, the combination of these two opposite fourth and sixth order spheric aberrations increased the subjective depth of field by full 118%, which is significantly more than any other combination mentioned here. So that's why the optical engineers engineer that into this lens. Uh, of course, if you modify the monofocal lens, uh, there are some dumps, downsides and the lens should be well centered. You see uh, the typical retinal image for two millimeter, three millimeter and five millimeter pupil and to see some blur at five millimeter uh, with the five degree tilt, there is no uh, deterioration. And with 0.4 millimeter decentration, there is still very little deterioration. So definitely this IOL is uh, more forgiving for these imperfections compared to the trifocal technologies. Currently we have uh, a blue light uh, blocking and uh, the clear uh, versions made from the a polymer which has been already quite a few years on the market. There are some basic features of this uh, platform and it's available from zero to plus 34 diopters. And uh, you see the injector from Medicel for uh, 2.2 millimeter uh, incision. And there is this specific uh, protective plate which makes the injection uh, even safer. And I'm, now I'm going to uh, share a video with narration, so uh, you will hear the, and see the video. Uh, the first part of the video is a capsule laser, capsulotomy, and then uh, look smart IOL implantation. At this cataract surgery, we will perform capsule laser, capsulotomy, and implant EDOF IOL. The anterior capsule is stained by Tripan Blue for proper laser capsulotomy. The dye is rinsed out of the eye and anterior chamber filled and cornea covered with OVD. Capsule laser is mounted underneath of the surgical microscope and is turned on. A surgical lens is placed over the cornea, is centered and focused, and then just in 0.2 seconds, the capsulotomy is performed. 
The laser cut is perfectly circular. Central capsule disc is phaco aspirated. Hydro dissection is performed and less material is phaco emulsified. Lens cortex is aspirated by biaxial cadillas or around the capsule back circumference. <coughs> the back and anterior chamber are filled with OVD. Here is the detail of circular capsule laser capsulotomy with blue stained edge. A box with LuxMart EDOF preloaded intraocular lens is opened. Here is the lens itself in the AcuCheck injector. The inside of the injector is rinsed by saline solution to activate the coating for optimal smoothness. The lens is advanced and then injected into the eye through 2.2 millimeter incision and delivered inside of the capsule bag. The lens well centers and it is easy to reach under the optic through capsule laser capsulotomy to aspirate the remaining OVD. The LuxMart lens centers again after this maneuver. This is the final outcome of LuxMart EDOF IOL implantation after capsule laser capsulotomy and cataract removal. So that was the video and now I'm going to share the clinical study results and uh, this, uh, these are the first world first uh, results. Uh, this is the design prospective uh, study on 30 patients in two centers, bilateral cataract surgery with bilateral look smart implantation. You see the pre-op uh, workout one week, one month, three and six months. At this moment, we have three month uh, results. So you see uh, our basic uh, uh, basic workout and uh, uh, pre-op monocular uh, uncorrected intermediate, distance corrected intermediate at 66 and 80 centimeters. And uh, then at one month and three months, and, and then we added some defocus curve and questionaries. So uh, cataract with no other comorbidity, 50 years or older patients, regular coronal astigmatism below 1.5 diopters, main exclusion criteria, irregular astigmatism, previous intraocular or corneal surgery, traumatic cataract, advanced or decompensated glaucoma, or significant dry eye. So have a look at three month results of 20 eyes. Uh, you see the refraction. Uh, and uh, we see a little bit myopic result, minus 0.4 diopters uh, in three months. So we adjusted uh, the A constant uh, according to this from 119.2 to 118.6. And then the results uh, were more on target. Uh, Monochloral uncorrected visual acuities to different distances very well described the performance of this IOL. So you see the uncorrected distance visual acuity 0.11 logmar, and then uh, both uh, 80 and 66 centimeters uh, uncorrected intermediate visual acuities are just perfect and excellent. And still uh, the reading is uh, quite nice at 40 centimeters, which was quite a surprise uh, from this lens to, to me. Binocular uncorrected visual acuities uh, to the same distances, even better results. So binocular uh, at three months, surprisingly again, we have excellent near visual acuity, which I'm not sure how long will it last or will all the patients have it, but this was again a very positive surprise. Monocular corrected visual acuity to different distances. Uh, you see we are just on target. Uh, corrected uh, distance visual acuity at six meters uh, at zero and uh, 80 and 66 centimeters distance corrected intermediate vision, just perfect. And a little bit worse uh, vision at 40 centimeters as you would expect from uh, EDOF IOL, but binocular even better results. And even the reading binocular is not bad at all. So I think this is a very, uh, nice uh, implant, which uh, will attract a lot of patients. 
Monocular defocus curve describes very well its performance and we uh, see excellent defocus range from minus two up to plus 0.75 diopters. So in other words, uh, this uh, picture just documents uncorrected vision from 50 centimeters, that's where you get with minus two diopters to half mirror, to infinity. So if you uh, monocularly can see uncorrected from 50 centimeters onwards with this EDOF IOL, I think that's uh, a very nice option to many of the patients. And I have one example of case report here, and that's our 66 years old bus driver with bilateral cataract and the, his subjective refraction pre-op was about plus two diopters. And we see the results at six months and you see excellent uncorrected and corrected distance. 1.0 OD, 1.025 OS, 1.6 bilateral. So, you know, this is just excellent distance vision. Uh, after we have adjusted uh, the A constant, we just exactly hit the target, zero refraction and distance corrected. So that means no correction at 80 and 66 centimeters. 1.25, 0.8, 1.25, and bilateral 1.2510. So look at this excellent intermediate vision. I think that really describes what the today contemporary EDOVIOL can deliver to our patients. And still this patient is able to read at 40 centimeters. So, well, I think that's something which will have a significant impact on the IOL market. So what changed in my practice with this uh, new EDOF IOL, we have gained a totally new IOL category. Uh, we offer monofocal uh, IOLs uh, typically to distance vision, only uncorrected. And then the second category, which is new, is EDOF for distance and intermediate with significantly lower risk of dysphotopsia and still trifocal IOLs, which cover all three distances, but with somehow high risk of dysphotopsia are a very, very attractive option for our patients too. So now we can offer the three options to our patients and that's exactly our strategy uh, at the moment. So in conclusion, we really document high quality vision to distance and intermediate. And of course we need more implantations and longer follow-up uh, as with all the new technologies, but I'm very happy I was able to uh, provide this uh, new IOL to uh, our patients and they are very happy with, with this IOL. Thank you for your attention and have a good time here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pavel. It is really wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, for me, this is very new technology. Maybe some uh, colleagues knows that, experience that, but this is, I think, in the world, maybe limited surgeons uh, experience about that. Uh, I am sure we will discuss more after uh, other speakers, but I cannot wait to ask you first, uh, if you give any uh, near glasses or how often you give near glasses uh, in 30 cases, uh, this is one of my questions very quickly. And second question, uh, which group uh, patients moved to, com you converted uh, to this EDOF technology from monofocal to uh, EDOF technology or from trifocal patients you moved to this EDOF technology? Okay, thank you so much, Eileen. So the first question is about the reading glasses. We do not promise uncorrected reading to them at all. That's the starting point. And whenever they need it, they get it. Either they get it from us or they buy it from an optical <laughs> shop, whatever. So we don't really have exact statistics at this moment. We will get it at six months. But some of them definitely do use the reading glasses. And that's uh, you know, part of this deal. And uh, which uh, patients opt for that? From my practice, we take more of the patients from the monofocal IOL category because we try to make it simple and we just tell them, well, either you can get the monofocal IOL, whether it's a standard or premium with some, you know, uh, better features like optical filters, aphericity, preloaded, whatever. It, there are different strategies for to, to sell, upsell monofocal IOLs in different parts of the world. But then we say, or you can have an IOL which is close to this category, but significantly enlarges, you know, your spectacle independency towards the mobile phones 
navigations and so on. And patients understand that very well and clearly. We don't really, you know, tell too long story about that. And from the trifocal uh, population, uh, we have some patients which really fear uh, the halo and glare and they don't really insist on that uh, near vision. And then uh, some of them uh, opt for this uh, option. Uh, having said that, uh, still a lot of people and majority people who really want spectral independence go for trifocal because it's not only about reading, it's also about like cutting your nails or many different uh, activities which you need you know, the near vision. So to make it short, mostly the monofocal population understands very well that if they see the phones and navigations, it's worth to pay some premium and some of the trifocal patients who are afraid of halos and glare. Okay, uh, last question. Uh, quickly again, a lot of speakers because uh, when we organized this study, actually we were a little bit uh, confused about uh, terminology. We cannot call this group lenses monofocal. We cannot call co completely presbyopia correcting or only EDO. What, what you, you would uh, choose, which terminology is right terminology for you, for okay. this group lenses? I think EDOF is very nice, uh, nice name, but patients, uh, it's a very new, uh, a very new word for them. So we created a new category, we call it a focus lens and uh, we explain it like that. But from my point of view, it is closer to monofocal compared to trifocal or, or multifocal, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but uh, is a, a monofocal IOL with significant spherical aberration still in monofocal IOL? I think Michael is an optical expert and there can be a lot of debate later on. But again, as I said, it's closer to monofocal than to, to multifocal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now uh, I am moving new, uh, uh, new speaker, another speaker, uh, Francesco Carones uh, from Italy, Milan. Uh, medical director uh, in uh, Caronis Vision. Uh, she will talk about VVT intraocular lens. Thank you so much, uh, Francesco, join us. Thank you so much, uh, Eileen uh, and uh, Michael and Chris as well uh, for uh, inviting me to speak about this very sensitive topic uh, because uh, these new IOLs are really changing the way that we are delivering vision patient to patients after lens replacement, uh, and I really think that the DVT has a huge role in this, uh, as I'm going to explain you in a while. I have some financial disclosures uh, to make. Uh, I consult for Icon Laboratories, uh, as well as for other companies. Let me start uh, from uh, uh, the problem, uh, that is, uh, uh, what are we doing to correct presbyopia when we replace uh, the eye, uh, the lens, either for cataract uh, purposes or for uh, refractive purposes? As you see from this keypad, uh, unfortunately, up to now, there is no way for giving high multifocality, I mean, high spectacle independence, uh, and at the same time, uh, very low or no dysphotopsia and night vision symptoms. That's the limit that the technology provides us uh, with today. And we know that for uh, a lot of patients, uh, the most important goal with the surgery is uh, uh, getting spectacle independence. And today, the uh, uh, golden standard we have uh, are trifocals because uh, this technology is amazing in the amount of uh, spectacle independence that they provide. But unfortunately, as you can see listed here, these technologies uh, also have uh, some uh, kind of, you know, drawbacks, uh, compromises that the patients have to consider and accept, uh, of which uh, probably this photopsia is the most important one. On the other hand, uh, we have uh, other lenses uh, called EDOF, uh, as you learned from Pavel uh, earlier, and EDOF can be either diffractive or uh, non-diffractive. And uh, again, the quality of uh, uh, results they provide is good or, uh, let's say, fair to good in terms of spectacle independence. Uh, but again, some, uh, some kind of drawbacks as are associated uh, for diffractive uh, EDOF, uh, there is a still this autopsia as one of the problems uh, for non-diffractive technologies. Uh, uh, the spectacle independence they deliver is lower and uh, they are a little bit uh, uh, pupil size dependent, thus inducing some uh, fluctuation in vision. 
I'd like to show you this uh, graph uh, that has uh, spectacle independence and dysphotopsia on the X and Y axis, uh, showing that uh, if we consider monofocal eye wells, uh, obviously the spectacle independence level that we get is very low. At the same time, we get a very high quality of vision and no dysphotopsia. So here is where the, the refractive and diffractive uh, EDOFs uh, are. The refractive EDOFs uh, actually provide a little bit more spectacle independence, but less uh, uh, quality of vision. Uh, the diffractive EDOFs uh, are exactly the opposite. And here is uh, where the trifocals and the hybrid technologies are today. So they deliver a lot of spectacle independence uh, at the cost uh, of uh, higher levels uh, of dysphotopia. So there is this kind of trend of, uh, uh, you know, the more that you deliver spectacle dependence, uh, the higher is the compromise that you have to accept uh, as regards quality of vision. What is the solution with the BVT, which I, I think is an amazing solution? Is this uh, so-called non-diffractive X-wave technology? So this uh, technology consists of uh, two smooth surface transition elements uh, that simultaneously stretch and shift the wavefront, meaning they, as you will see in the next slide, one of the element actually uh, delays the wavefront and the second element actually elongates the, 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 the wavefront as well. It makes it running faster in, 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 uh, in the light. So at the end, uh, you will see like in this uh, 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 image, in this graph, what happens, uh, uh, some part of the wavefront is stretched uh, and this goes advanced uh, into the uh, um, depth of field, into the focal plane. Uh, Another part actually delays uh, the wavefront by stretching it, uh, and uh, the sum of the delayed uh, and uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, advanced uh, uh, wavefront uh, actually elongates uh, the focal point, uh, given this uh, extended depth of focus that we are talking about. And if we see how this uh, uh, IOL performs uh, compared to a standard monofocal IOL, in this case, the same brand, uh, where we see that there is not a lot of uh, you know, elongation, uh, but the quality of vision, as you see in the image, is pretty good. Uh, if we compare the, 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 the a standard ED of diffractive IOL, not mentioning the brand, uh, we see that there is some sort of elongation, but the quality of vision tends to decrease. Uh, and here is what the acris of IQVV, the X-wave technology, allows to reach uh, an even more extended depth of field uh, at a cost of almost nothing in terms of dysphotopsia and night vision symptoms. And I think the most important part of my presentation has to focus exactly on this. Uh, the easiness of playing with these technologies, uh, or specifically this technology, is to be able to provide patients uh, with uh, some uh, significant, as you will see in a while, spectacle independence uh, at almost no cost uh, in terms of uh, dysphotopsia. So where is the BVT? Uh, uh, falling in this graph. It's right there, meaning uh, better, much better spectacle independence uh, as regards uh, other uh, uh, refractive or diffractive IOLs. Uh, so basically, the, uh, uh, let's say, comparison between the VVT with the diffractive EDOF uh, uh, turns uh, the VVT being much better as regards the quality of vision, uh, as well as being much better compared to the refractive uh, EDOF uh, as regards the spectacle independence that the lens provides. As, as you can see here, as correctly uh, uh, Pavel was mentioning, uh, the spectacle independence that the VVT delivers is not comparable to what the trifocals or hybrid technologies are doing today, but you will see in a while how this uh, technology can be used uh, quite efficiently to really give patients uh, a lot of satisfaction, a lot of spectacle independence. Here is my study on the, my first, first 50 eyes uh, in a prospective way, 25 patients uh, with at least three months follow-up. Uh, uh, my first implant, uh, well, the first commercial implant in the world was done by, by myself uh, last year. And these were some sort of best uh, eyes uh, to be treated with very low amount of astigmatism. Uh, and uh, the way that I started immediately implanting this technology was uh, uh, as to get as close to Plano in the dominant eye and uh, having the non-dominant eye as close as possible to minus 0.5 diopters in a sort of a mini monovision fashion as to extend further the ability for these patients to be spectacle independent. And you see here, comparing, I mean, seeing first eyes and then patients, uh, yellow and green, how these patients uh, are doing. So basically, as regards uh, uh, eyes, uh, the accuracy and the 
let's say the uh, uncorrected visual acuity was pretty satisfactory for uh, the eyes uh, being uh, left uh, somehow a little bit uh, in the minus range, uh, as close as possible to minus 0 0.5, you can still see here that the uncorrected visual acuity was pretty satisfactory in a lot of them, meaning that this uh, uh, elongation of the focal point uh, not only gives uh, bad results uh, as regards uh, intermediate uh, to near, but also as regards uh, distance vision as well. But if we consider these uh, results uh, as for patients and not eyes, uh, you see that uh, with this strategy, basically you can reach uh, all patients having 20-20, 1.0 or better uncorrected vi uh, vision for distance and uh, J2 as 60 centimeters. Uh, and again, you see also that uh, you, you can see here that uh, even the 45 centimeters distance, meaning reading, brings these patients being in a significant uh, numbers, uh, like completely uh, spectacular independence. Uh, so my figure now is that, uh, uh, let's say, uh, three quarters of the patients never uses the spectacles at any distances at all. And uh, the quality of vision patients report uh, is uh, very, 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 very satisfactory. Actually, the, this photopsia report is very similar to what you would, would expect uh, from uh, someone who received uh, a binocular implant of a monofocal eye. In terms of res results, uh, as I said, these were uh, easy eyes to deal with, a very low amount of astigmatism and all of that. Uh, but you see here that uh, we were pretty accurate. And if you are accurate, uh, here is what you can get binocularly. So the uncorrected uh, distance visual acuity, 40 centimeters, uh, was excellent in all cases, better than uh, uh, 2021.0 in all cases, uh, the binocular uncorrected intermediate vision at 60 centimeters was uh, absolutely outstanding. But most surprisingly was the uncorrected visual acuity at 45 centimeters uh, for these binocular cases. Uh, you see here that uh, a significant percentage of the uh, patients uh, actually had either 2020 1.0 or uh, 2025 20, uh, 0.8 uh, as a final outcome. How this uh, translates uh, into a uh, defocus curve? You see here the comparison in between the VVT and a trifocal. Here is the binocular uh, uncorrected defocus curve of the, the, the VVT. And you see here how wide, how significant is the range. Here is not 0.2, here is a 0.1, meaning uh, uh, point, uh, uh, 0 0.8 or 2025, uh, actually you have a wide range of correction, almost picking to two diopters uh, of uh, depth uh, of focus. Uh, and uh, here is uh, how a uh, trifocal performs, at least in my hands. So from this slide, you can probably understand uh, why I really believe that there is room uh, for patients willing to have a VVT when you want to prioritize all that is in the blue area as the final outcome for these patients. Uh, as well as there are significant numbers of patients uh, where you want to prioritize uh, everything that is uh, closer in terms of distance near to the eyes uh, for reading purposes. And these are the patients where trifocals are to be uh, addressed to. If we analyze the aberrometry of uh, a VVT and a trifocal, in this case, uh, you will see it has, and here is a uh, low order aberrations uh, and the high order aberrations. Uh, you see how the wavefront is much less distorted uh, in eyes uh, receiving a VVT compared to uh, a trifocal ion. And obviously this is justifies uh, the better quality of vision they have at nighttime uh, in the completely absence of the perception of rings. Uh, I'm not saying halos because uh, a little bit of halos can be perceived as well as it can be perceived also with monofocal iOS uh, as Beatrice uh, showed earlier. But in terms of uh, spectacle independence, uh, here is the figure. So uh, over this uh, 25 bilateral implantation group, uh, Actually, 72% never uses the spectacles. And this is amazing for a lens uh, that was designed only to provide uh, some sort of uh, uh, useful uh, uh, or, or, or uh, uh, let's say intermediate uh, uh, uncorrected visual acuity uh, independence. So if we analyze uh, the spectacle independence in terms of activities, and you see here, green are distance activities, yellow are intermediate activities, 
red are near activities. And when you see here like a little bit of blue, it means a darker light conditions. And now you see the different activities. Uh, the question that uh, was asked to the patients uh, was how often to use glasses uh, for, the, for these activities. And here is the amazing part of the uh, uh, results that you may get. All that you see here in these bars uh, is when the patients say never. So never, never, never in uh, almost all conditions, uh, there are some situations like reading a menu or reading a news book, uh, especially reading a dark, uh, where as we said, uh, still 72% of patients uh, never uses spectacles. And I guess, I, I think that this is amazing. Obviously, there are patients uh, who always use uh, spectacles, uh, as you can see in uh, this uh, part of the graph. Uh, so what is very interesting to me to show you is that uh, it's more like a choice uh, for these patients. Uh, there is not a, late, a lot of uh, fading off effect. Uh, I'm using sometimes, uh, rarely, uh, often or so. Either they use or they don't use the spectacles uh, for those uh, more difficult activities. Uh, and again, I think that 72% of them not using them uh, spectacles at all. It's, it's an amazing figure. Here is the quality of vision at night. As I said, most important slide of all my presentation, halos and night vision problems. You see here, never any halos or night vision problems in 92% of patients, uh, mean, meaning, meaning uh, 23 over 25, uh, and uh, only occasionally in two of them. Patients are amazed uh, about the quality of vision they get uh, and the absence of uh, night vision problems. So just to conclude, to conclude, here is again my key pattern that I was uh, uh, showing earlier. What is the solution with the uh, X-ray technology from uh, 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 Acris of uh, IQ Vivity? If we still consider the spectacle independence is the goal, this technology really provides uh, some uh, significant uh, high, uh, um, high and satisfactory spectacle independence, uh, especially if you would like to adopt a mini monovision strategy, what I really suggest you to consider because patients uh, may uh, enjoy more spectacle independence at almost no cost in the, la in the eye that has been left uh, slightly myopic uh, in terms of distance vision. And uh, the profile as regards this photopsia is amazing. They have a, a huge quality of vision. What I like the most is the fact that it is really easy to predict the results uh, to tell the patients. I mean, you can tell the patients, uh, you will not have halos, so you will not have night vision problems, uh, and you will get uh, that independence that will allow to do a lot of tasks, uh, almost everything. You may still need uh, glasses to use uh, to read uh, when the print, when the font print is very really small on uh, during the nighttime and so. So I think that this is a device uh, not easy to use in a practice uh, because makes the life much easier uh, when consulting the patients, uh, I think is a device that uh, can really help us to expand the percentage of patients uh, that can take advantage uh, from presbyopia correcting IOS. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Francesco. We have a lot of comments, especially from Beatrice, wonderful question and wonderful comments, but we have time limitation. After Gert's uh, presentation, we will return to you back to discuss more. I don't feel we don't ask questions to you. We, we pass, we will you know. So now we will move to Gert and then we will continue. Next speaker is uh, Gert Alfart from uh, Heidelberg University, uh, Germany. Thank you so much, Gert. Uh, we are looking forward to hearing you. Yeah, it's a pleasure for me to be here. I'm talking about the eye hands uh, lens, and uh, there was already quite a bit of discussion uh, in the in the in the chat room, so to say, and also I think every uh, speaker already said something. I may also comment on that, but I think there's a lot of confusing information as well as uh, information that we can debate because uh, a lot of things don't really have a name. I, I have experience with a lot of lenses and do a lot of work for, for all kind of companies. So uh, I really can say I know a little bit about this EDOF, monofocal, whatever category we say. Uh, 
So innovation is, is, is a key word that has uh, not so often been used so far, but at the end of the day, a lot of companies try to be innovative and uh, do something else. And why not in monofocals? Because the last 10 years on meetings, we only heard a new trifocal or multifocal or whatever lens. But the monofocal lenses were never really in the focus because everybody thought they knew what a monofocal is. But if you think about this, Uh, 20 years ago, a monofocal lens was a, a rigid PMMA lens, uh, uh, just a spherical one. Yeah, then it was a, a normal monofocal was a foldable lens, maybe three piece. Then later it was a one piece lens. Then suddenly it was an aspheric lens. And even other things were, were put on the monofocal lenses. And all were called a monofocal lens. All the little additions we did were not really opening a new category. Uh, um, it was just the natural, I would say, advancement of monofocal technology. And the question is, if we have now also uh, uh, a new uh, uh, group of monofocals or is this in a, in a new uh, category? I would just say that, for example, the moving from the Technus one piece to the iHands lens is just an improvement uh, uh, of the Technus platform, which is almost 15 years old now. Uh, so we have a long experience with the Technus, uh, with all its features uh, for, for a long, long time. And the iHands is now adding another feature, which makes it a modern monofocal lens. You may call it monofocal plus, uh, but I still consider this as a monofocal lens. So the Technus One Piece and the eye hands, they look, look alike, they feel like, they smell like they were the same. Uh, they are just slight changes uh, in, the, in the optics. Uh, otherwise, the basic geometry and even some of the other features uh, uh, compensating for spheric aberration and stuff like this is what we have seen from the, from the One Piece uh, platform. But here, the focus now is uh, further development in enhancing the intermediate uh, uh, visual acuity. And intermediate visual acuity is also something we didn't even use the term 15 years ago or 10 years ago. It just came up uh, uh, most, mostly because of the trifocal and then uh, EDOF lenses that suddenly we have intermediate visual acuity and, and we test it at a certain distance. Um, we just published in the Journal of Refractive Surgery a kind of theoretical paper with simulated function of the uh, um, eye hands, uh, uh, which gives you also some explanation about the, the optics behind it for those who, who are interested to, to see that. I just put this picture here, which is the uh, uh, simulated defocus curve, which shows you the monofocal technus curve and the eye hands curve. So on the first look, if you look at this, this doesn't really look like a big sensation and, and, and quantum leap difference to whatever, but we see a difference. We see a slight improvement here. And depending on what visual acuity level you're looking, we can see like a diopter or something more. Uh, um, so if we want to calculate the area under the curve, we can see a substantial difference between uh, the normal aspheric monofocal and the new design. The eye hands is actually a lens that uses a high order aspheric anterior surface, which is going continuously uh, from one end to the other or one edge to the other in uh, terms of power progression, which gives you a certain depth of focus. And uh, otherwise, nothing else than we have seen from the um, normal thickness. That doesn't mean that you have a, a kind of a zone or something in there. Uh, it gives you uh, a more or less seamless uh, um, way of optical light performance, which creates a, a tiny increase in, in, in central uh, depths of focus. So it's not a zonal lens like the old uh, refractive lenses we, we have, or a general change of spherical aberrations or something like this. Uh, if you want to make a kind of picture of the optical path, you may have an, a certain enhancement of a certain part of the light that goes through, which gives you a slight improvement uh, here in the intermediate range. But still, I consider this a monofocal lens. Uh, we also just published, uh, it's kind of online available, not as a, as a print, uh, the, uh, the quantum uh, study, uh, uh, multi-center European trial uh, with the uh, uh, IONS lens. 
Um, here uh, we had uh, two equal groups, around 60, 70 patients with the uh, ICB, which is the uh, eye hands lens and the technus, the ZCB, and was prospective multicenter bilateral randomized uh, evaluator mask clinical trial. So it was really uh, a good, good design. Uh, primary endpoint or outcome measures were the distance corrected intermediate visual acuity, and then some secondary endpoints. If you just look here at the um, monocular distance corrected intermediate visual acuity, you see uh, a statistically significant improvement of one line, not only one line, uh, 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 comparing the eye hands to the technus uh, uh, standard monofocal lens, distance corrected as well as uncorrected, as you can see here. Uh, best corrected uh, uh, was not really a difference, even though the technus lens is a slightly uh, better, as you can see, but this is, I wouldn't really consider that as a clinical significant improvement. If we uh, look here at the binocular uh, data, we see a similar or a slightly more differences, 1.1 line difference in terms of intermediate vision and uh, similar uh, changes in terms of the uh, binocular distance uh, visual acuity or uncorrected visual acuity. So with the eye hands, you may have slightly less uh, distance acuity, but you're still getting the uh, zero LOCMA or even above that. So I th think that's okay for a lens. Zero difference in terms of uh, contrast sensitivity. It behaves like a monofocal lens and has the same, uh, uh, under, under the same testing and light condition methods, you have the same outcome. Um, also here, just a questionnaire about glare and, and halo and so on. You see there's no difference uh, what the patient report here uh, in terms of outcome. Uh, Interestingly, the theoretical simulated uh, uh, defocus curve is pretty similar to what the, the study uh, showed, as you can see here. And I want to show you how that works in a normal clinical situation. So we looked, when we we got like 18 months ago or almost two years ago, the first uh, lenses implanted and uh, we did some follow-up on them and, and looked at some, some of the data. And these were unselected patients. So we are not only a best case scenario, there were patients that had corneal uh, or macular uh, conditions, uh, of course, not really severe conditions, but we didn't really exclude uh, cases which will not come out 2020 or better. And you see here the difference, the distribution uh, of the age groups and the IOL power. Uh, using a platform like the Technus for long, long years, uh, we can see that the, the outcome in terms of refractive uh, outcome is, is quite good. Uh, uh, target equivalent was minus 0.2, achieved was minus 0.13. So we were there uh, where we wanted to be using these A constant. And we had patients where we were uh, targeting uh, the minus range uh, uh, or a metropia. And in this unselected group, visual acuity was pretty okay, I would say here, uncorrected, average uh, visual acuity, monocular, uh, you see that here 0.1 uh, uh, or best corrected uh, over 0.1, intermediate and also even near acuity, uncorrected 0.3, uh, LOCMA, which is 0.5, uh, a decimal is enough for reading uh, a newspaper or book. So this is quite decent actually. Uh, even though when we tested patient needed uh, almost two diopters of near addition for uh, full vision in, in the near. And similar to the defocus curve that we have seen, we get at the 0.2 uh, LOCMA level, something around 1.25 diopters of uh, depth of focus, or you can say you have plus minus half or plus minus one diopter of uh, landing zone in terms of IOL calculations or other things that you are interested in, for example, in post-LASIK patients. So it gives you this uh, little extended uh, range. The uh, complete study included also contrast sensitivity on various things you can see here. These are all normal values that we saw. And I want to show you one clinical case where I thought we can really see that this has an impact which can be used in a, in a refractive terms, even though uh, I'm kind of hesitant to call it a refractive lens. And in Germany, at least, it's sold as a more or less a uh, little bit higher priced monofocal lens. Uh, 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 so like a normal lens, a patient don't really need to pay anything extra. It, it gets it completely reimbursed uh, when I use it in my clinic. 
we had a patient that came uh, uh, and reported uh, uh, about problems he had when he was 62. He got cataract surgery. And uh, at that time, he got an Ocalentis M plus uh, 3, a multifocal a segmental uh, refractive lens in uh, two, three years ago. But he came and complained about uh, difficulties uh, in uh, bright, dark changes, extreme halo glare uh, and large halos and this photopsias, which I have to say is a little bit unusual for this lens, but it can uh, happen in individual cases. Uh, of course, somebody tried to do a yak laser capsulotomy, which I don't really like in these cases because we were, uh, even though we were in the situation, we had a patient which has a 20-20, 1.0 visual acuity with a slight correction. It was a 2020 unhappy patient. And the reason for this was not really the visual acuity, it was this. You see here the halo glare simulator. So this patient uh, uh, really had problems with, with the night vision and with the uh, driving. So you can understand that he wants to get rid of the lenses. So the question then is when I put a multifocal lens out, how can I restore or compensate multifocality? Uh, he was at the point where he didn't care about multifocality anymore. He just want to get rid of the uh, dysphotopsias. But we looked about different things, what kind of lenses we had to calculate, especially in the left eye, we had already yak laser capsulotomy. So you may not be able to put in a uh, capsule fixated lens or you have to do a vitrectomy or something. So we had different lenses uh, 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 on standby. Uh, what the first eye went uh, well, both eyes went well. In one eye, I put in a monofocal uh, a lens uh, uh, with, uh, with the uh, AR40E, which I put in the sulcus after anterior vitrectomy. And, uh, and you see that here, this is the lens. And the other one uh, we, can, we could uh, take out and put in uh, the Technus eye hands in the capsular bag. And the interesting thing was after two weeks, after everything has healed off, his binocular performance was almost uh, as if he had a three uh, uh, trifocal lens, uh, uncorrected distance 1.0, intermediate 0.63 and near even uh, uh, 0.8. So uh, he was quite happy about the visual outcome here. And if you see the difference in terms of halo glare before and then with the eye hands, you see these are uh, completely different worlds. So the patient was, was extremely happy with that uh, um, and even got a decent amount of uh, intermediate and near acuity. And interestingly, we combined a spherical lens with an aspherical uh, enhanced lens and both performed pretty well actually here. So um, the comparison showed that we really have an enhanced intermediate visual acuity, but not uh, uh, a huge amount where uh, uh, I would be, I think, from an ethical point of view, uh, uh, feel comfortable to ask a thousand euro or something for a lens. Uh, uh, the distance acuity was more or less unaffected. Uh, there was a monofocal lens uh, profile of photic phenomenon. Uh, uh, of course, we have some other uh, uh, advantages which are important for a monofocal lens, look, talking about the material uh, uh, so that you don't have glistenings or calcification, So, which is also something we have to think about when we talk about monofocal or even premium lenses. And uh, I would summarize this as a, a monofocal plus lens or maybe the new standard or normal monofocal lens uh, uh, if we take into account that we have further developed over the last couple of years our IOL technology and that some slight uh, enhancement of uh, depth of focus should be something normal we could uh, expect from a new modern uh, a monofocal IOL. Maybe we can debate that. Uh, um, but this is where I would place this kind of uh, a new lens uh, in the market and uh, um, interesting to hear what, what you guys uh, think about that. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Gerd. It is really wonderful presentation. I think Chris want to ask question. Uh, Chris, or I will continue. No, I was just gonna say that I'm going to launch the polling now to for the audience to the attendees to vote on the best presentation of the great IOL debate. So you have, uh, you have one question, just uh, answer, it's anonymous, and we'll tell you 
the winner after the final talk from Ricardo Vingiguera. Okay, so now uh, I would like to uh, uh, continue uh, discuss discuss and questions. First of all, I would like to uh, I would like to ask Beatrice. Uh, she made really wonderful comments about uh, monofocals and this uh, kind of premium lenses. Uh, Beatrice, could you make your comments again or uh, your question uh, to discuss? No, I mean. <laughs> Since we are now, we, we, have, we are not driven by the industry, I would just emphasize the fact that now I, I, most of us are just driving confused uh, because, I mean, Iraf put in a big family many concepts. We understood the key goal, uh, starting with my presentations. We are looking for uh, a continuity in the focus. The patient has no feeling of different distances and a good quality of vision. So, I mean, it's all about this a new uh, progress is made in optics. But at the end of the day, we, are, we can understand that EDAF is putting together different kind of concept. Uh, and so I'm curious uh, to imagine as a, like a novice surgeon, if uh, how we can understand how, this, how you can make your choice and if we, we should maybe categorize in a different way, this big, huge chapter of, of EDAF. Because, I mean, we also pick up the idea, thanks to all this presentation, that now we're, we do have a, a, new, uh, a new niche in this era, which is this monofocal plus. So my two key comments is, first of all, should, should we maybe record them in a different way, based on the, on the, on the, on the, optic, on the optical principle? Um, and the second key point is, uh, what about the economical model? Because, I mean, can we maybe make a difference? like monofocal plus, a better rate for reimbursement, not the, the same kind of level of extra cost, EDAF in between, and uh, multifocal as, as a key and conventional, uh, I would say refractive IOL. So, I mean, uh, I think that these two aspects uh, could certainly be a, a, a good subject of discussion for our audience. Because I mean, at the end of the day, we need also to take into account the, the cost of all these lenses, because we are seller yeah. of lenses. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Francesco, do you think uh, VVT or this kind of this group of lenses will be uh, in the future will replace with monofocals? What do you think? Well, that, that that's a huge question, and uh, the 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 answer is more economical then uh, uh, performance, performance is related, at least uh, as regards uh, those uh, lenses uh, providing some sort of significant uh, spectacle independence. Um, if uh, some of these platforms, uh, like the Luxmart, uh, like the uh, BVT, I think the Isopure as well, may be set uh, at the same price uh, as monofocal IOL. So they will definitely be used uh, on a routine way. I mean, by everybody, also by public hospitals, uh, just because uh, there would not be any limitations in terms of price. I, 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 if I can make a small comment uh, to uh, uh, go back to what Beatrice was saying, uh, um, I, I'm, and I'm joking, obviously, we are here to play. I don't care about you doctors. I mean, we are experts. Uh, Whoever is on the line now is listening to us uh, and they understand what we're talking about. Who are not understanding are the patients. Uh, so I don't think it's correct uh, to refer to the patients uh, in terms of uh, the optics of the IELTS. Uh, I don't explain the patients, this is a trifocal, this is a need of, uh, this is a modified here and there and there. What I think the patients need to know is uh, performance. Uh, and performance is related to the amount of spectacle independence uh, the IOS uh, deliver and uh, associated uh, quality of vision potential issues. Uh, and this is all the patients need to know. I mean, nothing else than that. So when, it, when I consult a patient, uh, I tell the patients, uh, we have different choices uh, going to from, let's say, no spectacle independence down to full spectacle independence. Uh, and we have uh, choices going to no night vision or dysphotopsia to some significant potential night vision dysphotopsia. That's it. I mean, I think that everything else is going to confuse them and is not going to be very appropriate uh, to be discussed with the patients. Mm -hmm. I can, patients can. came to... Oh, 
Please. Hi, hi, Eileen. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. If I can comment on that, yeah. I, I absolutely yeah, agree. Please. The more lenses we have, uh, the more choices we have, the more exciting our field is, but it also the more confusing it becomes. And in our practice, what we have found has helped a lot in, in the uh, process of uh, not only training our staff, but also converting our patients to this type of lens technology has been for us to uh, really pick, uh, pick our favorite that fits in each visual category. So in, in our mind, uh, you know, our favorite monofocal that we think gives the best optical outcome uh, for uh, that type of category of patients, our favorite lens that gives us that mid range and distance. So again, it's more of the, the way the patient uses their eyes. Uh, so that kind of the eat off or vividity is now our favorite uh, mid range and distance. And then our favorite multifocal, um, which is now panoptics in our practice. And then the light adjustable lens, which I'll talk about. So in a way, it, it kind of, we forced ourselves to remove the multiple different options in each category so that the training process, the transition would be easier. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are on, on approaching it that way. Yeah, yeah, so very, very nice comment. Thank you, Neda. Uh, so uh, uh, what about Gerd, uh, when patient came to you, uh, when they want to remove their glasses, uh, would you recommend a hands uh, sometimes when they want to just their visit of you to remove their glasses? Well, I cannot, your glasses. I, I cannot say that, that this is my first choice. I mean, it's a different if a patient comes to me and uh, wants a refractive surgery to get uh, rid of the glasses or if a patient comes to me uh, who needs uh, cataract or lens surgery and then we talk about the options, what kind of uh, lens I put in. That's a completely different type of, of patients. Uh, uh, an eye hands could apply, it could be possible, uh, 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 but it wouldn't be the very first choice if somebody comes and says, I wanna get rid of glasses, I wanna read without any uh, uh, glasses, I wanna see intermediate and distance. Then we're talking about a, a different story. Uh, um, but if somebody comes to me as cataract surgery, uh, uh, and uh, uh, is asking uh, me about premium lenses. And you may be amazed how, how much my patients sometimes know already about uh, trifocals or something. They suddenly come up and ask you about rings on the lenses and, and uh, uh, side effects that they haven't done 10 years ago or five years ago. Uh, then you have, of course, uh, a choice to tell them we have lenses that have a uh, certain functions, but also some side effects. And we have other lenses that have no side effects, but limited functions. And then you talk with the patients. Um, yeah, I depends, think the, yeah. The, the big problem is that uh, uh, we have a view from the patients. We have a view uh, uh, from uh, the companies. We have the view from the researchers. We have the view from the surgeon. And they all talk about different language and they all have different uh, 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 aims or targets or, or a different agenda behind everything. Uh, you can yeah, use exactly. any lens to make a successful practice out of it. Mm -hmm. If you are really yeah. trained with it, if everybody is trained, you can only implant a symphony in every patient and find find good indications. You can do only trifocals. You can do only monofocals and do monovisions. Uh, we see that on meetings where we have uh, colleagues that say, "I only do monovision and." all my patients are happy. And then the next come and say, I only do symphony and everybody is happy and so on and so on. Yeah, this is also what, what Neda said. If you really get into that topic and you uh, find yourself uh, a, a lens type or a way how to uh, examine patients and include and exclude uh, them, then you can live on one lens. And this is what a lot yeah. of surgeons like to have. Uh, but I think the variety of patients that we have require you to have a little bit more choices, not only one. Uh, you have to make, yeah. I always say we look for the lens for the patient and not for patients for, for the lens I like to implant. Yeah, But mm -hmm. those is possible. It, yeah. it, it is possible. You can be a successful surgeon and really just, you know, do one lens or, or two types or whatever and, 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 and get that done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Okay, now I will have a uh, last question. We have time limitation. I asked this question to Powell about terminology. Uh, Powell told that uh, ED of monofocal. Uh, what about Francesco and Gerd? Which uh, terminology would fit this uh, kind of uh, 
uh, advanced technology, which is the best for uh, this group lenses. Uh, yo, Pavel, you answered. I am right, Pavel. You answered in the <laughs> monofocal. <laughs> yeah. You can add more if you want. <laughs> Francesco, go ahead. No, I, I, if I can very quickly share my screen and show you a very uh, uh, fast image, here is the way that I yes. usually um, tell the patients and uh, my colleagues on how to classify the lenses. So as I was telling you, I, I classify the lenses in terms of spectacular independence and dysphotopsia. So give me an example. How is the, the IANS? The IANS is, is, a, is not a standard monofocal IOL. It's an extended range of focus monofocal IOL with a standard, uh, with a non-diffractive modified optic uh, IOL. And you see, you, you can, using these definitions, you can really play with all the lenses that are available today and just explain colleagues, uh, patients, uh, whoever, very easily, what is the performance of these uh, lenses. So, EDOF means nothing to me. It's just confusing. Uh, we categorize some lenses into the EDOF group, and these are not EDOF. Uh, give you an example, the ATLARA. ATLARA is uh, commonly classified uh, as an EDOF. Uh, while we know it's a trifocal, well, the trifocci are not getting so close uh, to, the, to, to a distance for reading easily, but it's a trifocal. So again, it, it is classified as a EDOF. So I don't think that going into that is going to bring uh, advantages uh, in terms of uh, understanding, uh, and especially for the patients, uh, this is not going to be easy to, uh, to, to understand. I mean, wh why should a patient uh, choose a trifocal? What is trifocal meaning to a patient? I think it's much better to say, to tell a patient, uh, you're going to choose a full range of distances uh, placed by your correct denial. That, that makes much, a, much more sense to me. Yeah. Well, uh, what about Gert? Yeah, well, uh, when I just see that, uh, uh, maybe just be more provocative. If we have a lens that only is monofocal, we call it monofocal. If we have a, a lens that can see in the distance and in the intermediate, then I would call it bifocal. And if we have one that can also see in the near, then it's called trifocal. So more or less it's that simple, but the term of bifocal lenses is already taken uh, by the old uh, diffractive and refractive uh, uh, multifocal lenses. But essentially, it's, that's what we're talking about. And how you achieve to have two foci, let's say intermediate and distance, that just depends on a lot of optics. Yeah, You have a low ad lens, which is uh, meeting the intermediate, or you have a pinhole lens, or you have this or that. Yeah, But essentially, we're talking about one, two, or three uh, areas of vision where you fulfill a certain amount of vision quality. Uh, uh, and that's what we have, essentially. Yeah. Pavel, do you have a comment? You were telling something. I interrupted you. No, no. I think Gerd said it perfectly that, you know, bifocal for two distances would be perfect, but historically uh, it was messed up. So we are <laughs> with Edof today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, Michael, do you have any, any comments? Uh, I think we, you know, Gerb made a very good point. You, depending on your personal or your industry perspective or clinician perspective, you can you can terminology. But you know, I think we need to find a common ground among how we communicate those optics to the patients and the benefits to the patients, and how we're explaining this patient to the patients. And on the other hand, I think on on a scientific clinical discussion, um, I think. Uh, at the end of the day, we have our, as Beatrice showed, we have our metrics to evaluate the different quality of these lenses and quality of vision is at one point. Uh, the benefits we're getting in terms of, you know, near vision is another point. Um, so I think we, we still will have that gap between um, the clinical communication to patients versus our scientific perspective. And whether an optical perspective is necessary, whether this is multifocal, bifocal, whatever, I'm not so sure. So I think we should work around a terminology using it in terms of some sort of extended depth of focus, but uh, matching that with, with the clinical data uh, from, from studies. And what is the range of vision we're generating for these patients? 
Okay, thank you. Now we, we will continue uh, with Neda. Uh, she is coming, uh, joining us from uh, Los Angeles, California, Alumni Shemi Vision Institute. She will talk about light adjustable uh, lenses. Uh, thank you so much, Neda, if accepting us uh, to be together is wonderful. We are listening to you. Thank you so much for inviting me, Island. Uh, what an honor for me to be with all of you international experts on this topic. And, um, and, and I hope what I share is, uh, comes of some value. Uh, so again, I thank you truly for, for your invitation, you and Michael. Thank you. Um, and, uh, and Chris for, for all the help and putting up with, with me uh, across, this, across uh, the borders. <laughs> Uh, thank you again. Um, my name is Neda Shami. I am uh, an ophthalmologist, a cataract refractive surgeon in Los Angeles. I'd much rather right now be in Istanbul and, and, or somewhere else to, to uh, travel. I really miss traveling, as I'm sure you all do. We are in a hot spot in California and Los Angeles, and life has, uh, really has shown no inkling of us going back yet. Uh, and, and I'm just uh, hopeful that the next time we all meet, we meet in person and you can be sure that I'm gonna give you all a really big hug. And hopefully by then we won't be fearful of hugs and, 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 and kisses. So thank you again um, for putting up with um, doing all this. So I am now not, a okay, there it is. Okay, perfect. These are my disclosures. So uh, Lijas will lens, uh, we've talked about the different types of lenses. Obviously we have come a long way from uh, when we started with cataract surgery. And even in the last five years, the evolution has been really rapid and exciting. Uh, but as I mentioned and alluded to uh, earlier, and we all have discussed, it's added a lot of confusion. It's added increased chair time. Um, it, it's added maybe some more barriers for surgeons to even bring this technology to their practice. The more choices they have, the more uh, paralysis is around that. And uh, on one hand, I think the early adopters or those who had already uh, entered this field uh, are gaining a lot of excitement around it. But unfortunately, those who maybe never took that first step are finding it even more difficult to maybe dive in. Uh, because the discussion point has become more complex. Uh, and, and, and the onus is on us who, and, and, and fellow surgeons who have that experience to really get the right message uh, uh, across to not just patients to be able to help the conversion and, uh, and, and their um, uh, acceptance of this technology, but also our colleagues who may not be taking full advantage of it. Um, the problem also is that the more advanced these lenses become, the more reliance we then have on optimized preoperative measurements. Thankfully, a lot of our diagnostic tools have also advanced through the years. And so they've kind of been growing and advancing and progressing uh, at about the same pace. Uh, and yet we're still having our outcomes impacted by limitations in biometry, lens formulas, and assumptions about ELF, ELP, I'm sorry. Um, and then lastly, we talked about uh, visual aberrations and 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 maybe uh, the more advantages some lenses have, the more trade-offs they may have to um, present, uh, such as glares and halos and loss of contrast. Thankfully, with Vividi, um, it's moving in the right direction, not the wrong direction. But having said that, as I said, the evolution has also led to a lot of limitations uh, and the need for maybe a paradigm shift or a new advance that potentially can uh, take on a different, uh, a diverge from the path, path we have been on and maybe create a whole new arm of options. And the light adjustable lens, uh, I believe, is really kind of that type of lens where it, it's a departure from what we've uh, done and maybe will open a whole new pathway, a whole new path uh, to further advances in the field of lens technology uh, where we think differently. Um, uh, as you all know, the light adjustable lens is a lens that is made of photoreactive uh, UV absorbing silicone. Um, and this lens is a three piece lens that in all purposes at first looks, uh, looks like a monofocal three piece lens. Uh, so what's nice about it is, is there's not much learning curve involved uh, in making the decision of using this lens uh, for, uh, for your patients, cataract patients. 
Uh, the ordinary cataract surgery is done with implantation of, of the lens. Um, what's really nice in, in this case is that you don't have to think about LRI placement or your corneal markings, uh, intraoperative aberrometry or axis alignments and such. And you can be more relaxed about your biometry uh, because the, like, uh, the lens can be adjusted postoperatively and we'll go over that. Uh, one of the probably biggest uh, barriers is the fact that the patient has to wear UV protective glasses until the lock-in is completed. And that's typically not done until about four to six weeks later. Uh, and so I find that in my practice, uh, this has been uh, one of the barriers. We thought it was gonna be the biggest barrier, uh, but actually the biggest barrier has been the prolonged uh, recovery to, um, not so much recovery, but the prolonged um, time to that optimized vision has been the biggest barrier as, as has the cost, because in our practice, we charge more for the light adjustable lens than we do for the multifocals and other premium lenses. Um, the UV protective glasses have, has been less of a barrier. Now that may be because we live in, in California. I live in California and I joke to patients and I say, you know, uh, Tom Ford uh, is thinking about designing the next level and that it immediately speaks to the entertainment industry world that I live in. But nevertheless, uh, I've been really surprised by how much the patients have embraced uh, wearing these um, glasses uh, while they're being uh, recovered from the lens and being optimized. So what are some examples of when the light adjustable lens is an ideal option? You know, at first it seemed like it was a no brainer for post refractive patients. Uh, my first series of patients were post RK. These were patients who I had told uh, don't have your surgery until we have the LAL. So I had a backlog of patients and, uh, in fact, as I suspected, they did brilliantly. Um, my first RK patient was a 16 cut RK, was 2015 uncorrected by the time we finished the adjustments. Now keep in mind uh, with the RK patients because there is a delay in stabilization of their cornea, uh, the four to six weeks of wearing the UV glasses got extended to about 10 weeks. Uh, so that's really important. So at first we thought that this was going to be really the niche for these types of patients, um, for this type of lens, that these types of patients, the post-refractive would be the really only ones who would benefit greatly from, uh, but also the astigmatism. Patients with up to three diopters of astigmatism, as we all know with toric lenses, as fantastic the technology is, um, uh, re alignment of the lens, uh, the rotation of the lens may occur, uh, but also the alignment of the lens with the axis of the corneal astigmatism uh, may not be right on target. And more importantly, the cornea may heal in a way that the uh, axis may shift. And so with this lens, you can adjust the refractive correction postoperatively into the in intraocular lens and essentially match it perfectly to your refractive error that has stabilized post-op. Um, it's also a fantastic option for refractive lens exchange patients who come in expecting LASIK type results, but they're not a candidate for LASIK and they're better candidate for refractive lens exchange. And with these patients, we know uh, that uh, getting their vision as optimized as possible is really important because they're not starting off with deterioration in their vision as a result of cataracts. And so they're expecting that 2020, 2015 vision. Um, but really, we've actually in our practice expanded it to all patients. It has now become our first lens that we recommend to patients. And the way we present it to our patients is that it is a lens that allows you uh, to customize your um, uh, vision to the distance of your choice. Now, if a patient comes and says, I really don't want to wear glasses for any distance, or I hate having to go look for my glasses for computer and near, uh, we veer away from this lens unless the patient has had a history of monovision um, or uh, is willing to give monovision a try because with the light adjustable lens, you can actually trial monovision post-op and do even titratable monovision, meaning, um, uh, you know, target minus 75 or minus 125 or whatever distance the patient then enjoys and, and for them to try it out in, in their activities of daily life and come back to you before you do your first adjustment. Um, so it really has uh, become a fantastic uh, new addition to our practice and a really strong uh, 
you know, added benefit to, to our patients. Now, what patients do we avoid? Patients whose pupils don't dilate well, um, that's challenging because the adjustments require dilation of at least six and a half millimeters. Patients on photosensitive meds, and that's a huge long list um, that I won't go over right now. Patients who have a difficult or can't come in for their adjustments. We have patients who come from out of town, and those are patients who um, won't be able to come in for their adjustments. And, and so we, we do present this lens, but we try to um, really kind of move towards other options that may be better. And anyone we feel would be non-compliant to glasses. Yesterday, there was a patient who was very interested in this lens, but unfortunately, I could barely examine him with a slit lamp because they were so photosensitive. Um, and he, he's always been photosensitive. So it wasn't a pathological photosensitivity as a result of other comorbidities. It was truly his um, uh, sensitivity to light and touch around his eyes. <clears throat> so a patient like that would not be a right candidate. And then anyone, again, as I, as I alluded to, anyone who um, uh, it expects full range of vision without glasses but is not interested in monovision, would not be a good candidate. How it works, as I mentioned, is just routine cataract surgery with implantation of the lens, which um, no added intraoperative measurements that need to be done, no LRIs. And then the patient is uh, managed similarly to what you do your post-op. The only caveat to this is we really push to have the second eye done a week later and no more than a week later. And the reason for that is so that the, the period of time that they have to wear the UV protective glasses is not too prolonged. Um, the patient then comes in at the two week mark after their second eye and, and is, is refracted and the decision is made as to what the target refraction should be for each eye. And at that point it's really important to get a commitment from the patient as to what their outcome should be. Because the worst thing one can do with the LAL is to give the patient the, the freedom to change their mind after every adjustment. When that happens, you really, well, we, we joke about and you say, you bring out the crazy in people, even yourself maybe, because you then want to cinch it here a little bit, here, uh, you know, there a little bit. Um, now in select patients, you may want to have that flexibility, but I think we have really tried to uh, get the patient committed to, no, you know, I want both eyes as best as possible at distance or no, I'd like to have monovision. Then, you know, with the monovision, we have them trial it with contact lenses for a few days and come back and give us a commitment. Um, and, and that seems to really have helped us streamline the process and not create wreak havoc in the, the flow of our practice. Um, the adjustments are office-based. You need to have the LDD um, system, uh, as you've seen here on the right side. As I said, desired refraction is entered. The patient comes in. They get refracted at every visit that they come in for the adjustment. Uh, we started off doing two refractions, just like we do with our refractive surgical patients. Um, but now we're moving towards just one refraction and dilate the patient. And then it's similar to YAG laser treatment. Uh, where in between my clinic patients, I jump in and I uh, start doing, you know, I do the light adjustments. It can take up to about two, uh, two minutes per eye. And this is what's really interesting is the treatment range. So the treatment range for sphere is two diopters in each direction. Can you imagine that? I mean, we're talking with other lenses, trying to get the patient within half a diopter of their refractive target. Well, in this case, you could fall asleep at the biometry because up to two diopters, you can be uh, in error, which I would not recommend obviously, but up to two diopters in error and be able to adjust that lens accordingly. Cylinder is also up to about two diopters, um, uh, but we actually have pushed the limit on that to about two and a half, even up to three with the rule um, and, and, and you have room to adjust. Now, Another pearl in this is that we found initially when we targeted Plano, for example, if Plano was the outcome, and if the patient turned out 2020 or 2025, uh, the day after the surgery, because you, you by chance hit that target as you, you uh, wanted to, um, then it's harder to, in a way, to make them happy because you want to start off with the outcome uh, maybe uh, closer to, um, um, closer to about plus 75 uh, so that you have room to adjust and really impress them. 
Uh, and this is kind of a schedule I'm not going to go over, but uh, as I mentioned, usually they're done within five, we uh, five weeks. Um, really, as I, as, you know, as the, the best benefit of this lens is that it shifts the discussion about refractive outcomes to after surgery when things are more predictable and uh, stable. Uh, and, and then as far as uh, the data, the data speaks for itself, uh, great, it's leans more the refractive outcome and the visual outcome matches more uh, refractive surgical outcomes where great majority of patients are 2020 or uh, 2025 or better. And, and we're, uh, you know, getting these patients within half a diopter to a quarter diopter, if not better. Uh, and uh, patients do quite well. Obviously, with anything integrated into a practice, it's important to update everything, including websites and training and marketing. Uh, and in conclusion, uh, as we know, the LAL is the first FDA-approved adjustable intraocular lens. It allows an office-based optimization of the vision after cataract surgery and really uh, allows for us to uh, shift that attention, the, the um, unreliable data uh, sets that we we capture and we rely on in other lenses to a very reliable post-operative adjustment that is truly disruptive innovation in IOL technology. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm sorry I went over my time, I think. I was gonna answer oh, some of these questions, but I think I did in my talk any, in, anyways, but if there's any other questions, please, happy yeah. to answer them. Uh, uh, Neda, if you have time, uh, we will listen quickly, Ricardo, because he has strict time, and then we can return to you back because there are uh, maybe a few questions. The, now we will listen, Ricardo, about ectasia diagnosis. Uh, he is from Milano. He, uh, thank you so much, Ricardo. <laughs> Sorry for late. No worries. So um, it sounds a, feel a bit strange because all of this uh, webinar was about IOL, so I feel a little bit out of place now, but uh, they asked me to speak about ectasia assessment, and so here we go. I'm going to uh, speak about a new way, actually it's probably one of the, is the only way to diagnose ectasia with the post lasik ectasia with an index, and... Okay, so my financial disclosure, the first one is relevant for this, this talk because I collaborate with Oculus since many years. And uh, uh, so laser vision correction is a very safe and accepted procedure to correct refractive errors. It has an excellent profile, but in a small amount of case, PRK, LASIK or SMILE, all the three of them can cause iatrogenic ectasia. And the sooner we diagnose ectasia, the better it is because we can treat it with crosslink. Up today, there is no gold standard to diagnose ectasia. If you go online in PubMed and you see all the uh, possible algorithms to diagnose it, they always rely on two scans. So they say a change of astigmatism, a decrease of uh, uh, vision, uh, increase of um, curvature. So it's not one diagnosis, like we do in keratoconus, for example. So the incidence of ectasia is very low, but it can come even years after the surgery. And we know that if ectasia is not treated, it can be as severe as it's needed to do a dalk. And there is no evidence that even SMILE induces a lower amount of ectasia cases. Very recently, there was a study in which they showed that the biomechanical change induced by LASIK and SMILE one month post-op is the same. LASIK extra, similarly, this does not prevent ectasia as there is no long-term randomized trial that proved the LASIK extra is safer than LASIK, the normal LASIK. So how can biomechanics help? We know that in keratoconus, the primum moments, so the first hit of uh, keratoconus is the change in biomechanical properties. So if this is the case, we could also use corneal biomechanics to help the diagnosis of uh, post-LASIK and post-refractive surgery ectasia. But there are many challenges. The first one is that you need to be able to separate normal patients from keratoconus, then stable patients that are norm, so stable post laser vision correction patients are abnormal 
with any indices, even TBI and CBI, because they are designed to separate normal from keratoconus, not stable patients after laser vision correction from ectasia. So then to be able to separate from a stable LASIK patient from an ectasia, you need a very large database. So we asked for help from all over the world, going from Rio de Janeiro to Japan, to Germany, to India, because we needed a very, very large database. And we have used the Corvis to uh, create this new index. So our index is aimed to separate patients that are stable after uh, surgery with ectasia. And also to create a semi-automatic approach to separate healthy patients from keratoconus and keratoconus from laser vision correction patients. So let me show you the AIM-1. We created a new index with 736 patients. They were enrolled in different continents because what it was very difficult to find, to find cases with ectasia post laser vision correction that are very rare, as we know, that were, didn't, were not treated with cross-linking yet. And also to have stable patient with at least two years of follow-up. So there were 785 stable patients, LASIK, SMILE, and PRK, and 51 post-laser vision correction ectasia patients. Most of them after LASIK, but there were also two from after SMILE and after PRK. So, uh, sorry, this is um, uh, a mistake, is at least two years of documented stability, and all surgery were done by very well-known world leader of refractive surgery. The ectasia were confirmed at least by one mast cornea expert. The statistical analysis was a logistic regression, but we used two databases, one for uh, creation of the index and the second one for validation. Particularly 20% of the database were used as validation. The CBI LVC is the, this new index. And uh, as I was saying, is, a, is aimed to separate stable from ectasia patients. In the training data set, the sensitivity was 100% and the specificity was 97. And in, in the validation data set, the sensitivity was 93.3 and the specificity was 98.51, which means that was also accurate in the validation data set. But in clinical practice, well, you need something else. As I was saying, you need, if the patient comes to your clinic and the patient doesn't know, which is very rare, but doesn't know if they had refractive surgery. Sometimes it happens, very rare, but also it's easy to have something like that in the clinic. So we also created another index that was aimed to help even in the separation of patients in a semi-automatic approach. We needed even more patients because most validated indices for the detection of keratoconus, such as KISA score, BED-D, CBI, and TBI, are unable to distinguish between a keratoconus and a post-refractive patient. So then we needed an even larger data set. So we included 4,280 patients, and they were also enrolled in different continents, and they were healthy controls, keratoconus, stable post-LVC, and ectasia, the same as before, the last two groups. The healthy patients were absolutely healthy with no previous surgery, no high myopia, no concomitant medication, and the bed D was at least less than 1.6. All patients were, were confirmed by another expert. Keratoconus, bilateral clear keratoconus with no previous ocular procedure. And the other two were the same as before. Statistical analysis was working like that. If you have a patient, is it abnormal, yes or no? We used a uh, the CBI to separate between normal and keratoconus. And I will explain you why. Because as we said, CBI is also abnormal in patient after laser vision correction, which means that you can use it efficiently to separate between normal and the rest. Then we created a second index to separate between keratoconus and post LVC. And at the end, we were applying the CBI LVC to separate between ectasia and stable patients. I will just uh, uh, skip the steps of the statistical analysis because of time concerns. And I'm going to show you directly how it works in the clinical practice. So 
This is a keratoconus patient. As you can see, this is the tomography and biomechanics report. You can see that the CBI is abnormal, the BED-D is abnormal, and the TBI is abnormal. And also in the Venture screening report. So this is as usual. What about if you have a stable patient? You will have a warning that will tell you post LVC recognized, and you just confirm which surgery had. Or in case you don't know, you just click post LVC. And then everything gets grayed out except of the CBI LVC, which the cutoff is 0 0.5. So everything that is less than 0 0.5 is normal. Same thing is the Vinci Guerrero screening report. You just get it in the bottom right. You click and then you get the CBI LVC, which is obviously the same. This is a post laser vision correction ectasia. You still get the warning. You click, and then here you can see that the CBI LVC is 0 0.91, so clearly abnormal. And the same thing is in the Vinci Guerrero screening report. Okay, I think I'm done and I'm right on time in 10 minutes. Thank you, uh, Ricardo, for a nice pre presentation. Uh, I think you have no time uh, to stay uh, for questions. But for us, this is really wonderful work. This is great job, very informative. Uh, I would like to explain you, speakers choose their own topics by their self. It was nice coincidence. Please don't feel you are outside. This is just coincidence. So <laughs> thank you so much. We will not take your time. Uh, is there any question? Are there any to, uh, for Ricardo? I have a quick question for you, Ricardo. Um, so, hi. So uh, you, you trained your data set and uh, then you validated the data set. They were yep. independent data sets. That's correct. Okay. okay. That's and correct. So basically what we, what we have done is that we have used 80% of the database, but the 20% is, is independent on the first 80%. Okay, but this is not, so it's the same data set, but it's just split it. Yes, yes, that's correct. That's so correct. That's, so you did the data verification, not a validation, where we have now a complete new data set that you can test against. So, uh, sorry, sorry for, for my wrong reply. So uh, what we have done in the first CBI, so the one of keratoconus and normal patient, we did this. So it was one database that was completely independent from the second one, and we did the validation. So what I uh, asked to, well, maybe this is wrong, but I asked this to uh, one guy that was uh, quite expert in, in stats. He suggested me with the fact that uh, most patients from ectasia, because the main problem were the 56 ectasia patients, because they were very yeah. few. They were coming mainly from one, that, from one center. So the, the, the biggest amount was coming from one data center. The problem is that if we were using that data center as independent, we would have lost all the others. So mm -hmm. the only way to, to solve this problem was to uh, to randomly select 80% and 20%. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Ricardo. Uh, last questions, Neda. First of all, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciated you a lot for late and uh, we had a break uh, for your presentation. We are happy to continue listening and I have a few questions to you. Uh, so we will be more comfortable without uh, time limitation as much as uh, I don't want to be quickly for you. This is very nice uh, also uh, technology. Uh, you were uh, showing us uh, your slides, five questions. We look forward to hear from you. Yes, of course. You had said, thank you, Eileen. And, and I'm sorry if I went over time, but um, you had offered some questions that would maybe lead to some discussion. I know there were some questions yes. also being asked. One of them was, um, what problem does the chosen technology solve? Well, as I mentioned, I think uh, missing the refractive target uh, becomes a non-issue with this lens. Obviously, it is still essentially a monofocal lens at the end, and, and that is a, a, a limitation of this lens. But I have to tell you that our experience clinically, at least, it has been that this lens has offered almost like a monofocal plus 
um, uh, not a full EDOF, but a monofocal plus type uh, refractive or visual outcome. Uh, so time will tell, and, and I think more information and more experience will definitely help us in that. Um, and, and it also allows us to, again, as I said, just hit that target perfectly. Um, how does this innovation change the life of patients? It probably changes it not necessarily for the positive in, in the beginning. It, it has, it, it was a little hard for us to shift our messaging after cataract surgery, where in every other type of uh, cataract surgery patient, we're celebrating, you know, us hitting that target or getting the refractive outcome where we want the day after surgery. And then with these patients, we have to, you know, uh, uh, it's almost like a corneal transplant. I think as a corneal transplant surgeon, I'm much more equipped in, in, in hand-holding these patients, um, in you know, making sure that they remain happy until we can lock and adjust it. Uh, as far as one last question I'll, I'll share with you, what does this innovation, why does it excite me? Well, it excites me not so much as to the way it is right now. I think right now is also very exciting for a, a big um, selection of patients. I'm excited about the application of EDOF uh, to it in the future, uh, using the light adjustment in patterns that may be customizable to be able to bring in that uh, optical um, advances that, that are permanently embedded in other lenses but making it adjustable. So a patient can try eat off. Uh, and okay. if they don't like it, you cancel it, you adjust it out. I think that's mm -hmm. going to be a real innovation and a huge paradigm in, 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 in the way we do cataract surgery. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So your patients accepting to use two uh, weeks glasses, they are using glasses two weeks. This is a question also from the chat, <laughs> chat room. Yes, it's actually more than two weeks. <laughs> it, and as I mentioned, we thought that that's going to be the biggest hurdle, but it has been not a significant hurdle for most of our patients. We have a sample of the glasses. We have them try it on pre-op uh, or prior to even during the consultation, actually, for them to see and feel what it, what it feels like on their face. And there have been a small percentage of patients, they put it on, they say, uh -uh, I don't think I can... Uh, wear this for too long and immediately we shift attention to a different lens option for that patient mm -hmm. but the ones who accept it as long as you have spent that chair time ahead of time to talk to them about the need to do that and the importance of it they've worn it it at sometimes it's five weeks six weeks for the post rk patient maybe two two months to two and a half months until they're that it's unusual but um yeah. you know six to eight weeks until their cornea stabilizes yeah, mm. yeah. So uh, U.S. patients pay uh, for this intraocular lens. In U.S., patients pay yeah. for this technology. It's different, obviously, in other practices. I can't speak for any other practice than ours. Uh, what I can tell you is that we're charging about two thousand dollars more per eye for this compared to our multifocal uh, package. Okay. And and okay. the way we calculated mm -hmm. that differential was. Um, Based on the number of extra visits, we, we, we said to ourselves and calculated what is the cost of doing YAG capsulotomy or what is the payment for YAG capsulotomy and multiplied that by five and, uh, and then added a little, a little bit more because of the extra time necessary to do the planning and the, the target planning and such. So, if, you know, in our practice, it's $2,000 more than the multifocal package. That includes laser. Okay, Thank you so much, all of you. Really, we appreciate it a lot uh, because you, you of, uh, all, uh, it was very, very nice meeting, very, very interesting topics uh, you gave us for your valuable times. Thank you a lot. Uh, I wish you a wonderful evening, wonderful day for you, Neda. <laughs> Thank so, you so much. Uh, you are away. We are evening. You are in the morning. So <laughs> hope to see you soon. <laughs> Look forward to it. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye -bye. Good night. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.